Chapter Eighteen of The Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Catastrophe After a miserable, feverish night of tossing and turning, Isbel at last fell asleep in the early hours of the morning. She awoke again at eight and at once got up. She felt dull and stupid, was incapable of quickening her movements. Her eyes gave her a sense of being sunk halfway in her head. So sluggish was her blood that whatever she chanced to look at seemed to possess the power of detaining her gaze for an indefinite period, though all the time she was not really seeing it. To crown all, she had a gnawing toothache. She was deeply depressed. She dared not think of Judge, yet all her preparations were made with the single view of journeying to Worthing that morning, immediately after breakfast. What was to come of her visit, she did not know. Perhaps nothing at all. Perhaps it might be the beginning of a new life. After dressing and before going downstairs, she stood a while at the window. It was a still, grey, dismal morning which threatened to turn to fog or fine rain. It was neither cold nor warm. She contemplated the engagement ring on her finger, playing with it as she smiled queerly. It was a pretty toy, and all her friends were very pleased with her for wearing it, but, supposing she was not destined to wear it any longer, who could tell what this day was appointed to bring forth, whether for good or for evil? What a quaint surprise for her little circle, if it were to prove that, after all, she had rich red blood in her veins, and not rose-water. Oh, she did not know what she felt. It could not be passion. She was conscious of no thrill, but on the contrary was thoroughly cold, dull, and despondent. But neither was she playing a part. Something called to her, and that silent voice was irresistible. It was something in that house. It was like the call of a drug. She was a drug maniac. But why judge, and why that ring yesterday? Could it be passion, a passion which kept flaming up and slumbering again? Each following day she found it harder to keep away from him. It was not his person, it was not his intellect, it was not his character. It could not be compatibility. Then what was it? What was this subtle attraction? which was proving so increasingly overwhelming. Was it that, underneath person, intellect, character, there was something else, something which never came to the surface, but disclosed itself only to the something else in her? And was all love of this nature, or was it exceptional, prodigious? Whom to ask? Who loved nowadays? Betrothals and marriages she saw all around her, but if it wasn't money, it was sexual admiration. She could see nothing else. Might not that secret, incomprehensible impulse which drew her to him be more worthy of the name of love than these despicable physical infatuations of worldly men and women? At ten o'clock she left the hotel, procured a taxi on the front, and within a quarter of an hour was standing inside the booking hall at Hove Station. It was not yet half-past eleven as she mounted the steps of the Metropole. She swept through the door and approached the office window, assuming an air of hauteur, which was contradicted by the trembling of her hands as she fumbled in her bag for her card-case. Producing a card, she passed it over the counter to the lady clerk. "'Will you please have that sent up to Mrs. Richborough?' The clerk looked at the card and at her, she said nothing, but went to consult with someone else who was out of sight. Isbel could hear them whispering together. Presently the girl came back and requested her to accompany her to another room, adjoining the office. Isbel did so. She was begged to sit down, and then left to her own society, the door being closed upon her. It was all very solemn and mysterious. A minute afterwards, a well-dressed man of middle age entered the room. He had a florid German-looking face and a bald forehead. He was wearing braided trousers, with an irreproachable frock-coat. 
Isbel took him to be the hotel manager. "'You are Miss Lomit, madam?' he asked with suave gravity, gazing at the card in his hand. She replied in the affirmative. "'You are inquiring for Mrs. Richborough?' Isbel had risen to her feet. "'Yes, I wish to see her.' "'You are a relative, madam?' "'Oh, no. Why?' "'It is my regrettable duty to inform you that Mrs. Richborough was taken suddenly ill in her room last night, and died almost immediately afterwards. A medical man, fortunately, was in attendance.' "'Oh, good heavens!' Isbel grasped the chair back to steady herself. The precise time was nine-fifteen. It was very sudden and very sad. Naturally, we are anxious that this should not be known among the other guests. I feel sure that I can rely upon your discretion, madam. Oh, what a tragedy! But surely Mr. Judge knew of it? Yes, Mr. Judge does know. Could I speak to him a minute, please? Will you send my name up? I regret that it is impossible, madam. Mr. Judge left us this morning. Left you? Do you mean he has gone away? Altogether? Yes, madam. He has returned to London. But has he taken his things with him? Isn't he coming back? No, he is not coming back. One moment, madam. He consulted the card in his hand. I believe he has left a letter for you in charge of the office. If you will pardon me, I will go and inquire. Isbel could not even find words to thank him. She sat down, feeling as if the roof had fallen upon her. She understood that a catastrophe had happened, but she was unable to realise its final significance. It was the clerk who brought the letter in a moment or two later. She handed it to Isbel with a pleasant smile, and instantly retired. She broke the seal with clumsy haste, the letter ran as follows. My dear Miss Lomont, I am sorry to inform you that Mrs. Richborough died suddenly last night of heart failure. The doctor who attended her earlier in the evening had ordered her to bed, and she went there. But a little while later, according to her maid's evidence, she insisted upon rising in order to write an urgent letter, which letter she further insisted upon posting in the hotel box with her own hand. The additional strain upon her lowered vitality, which this entailed, evidently proved too much for her, for half an hour afterwards she was discovered lying in a dying condition in her room. There will, of course, be an inquest. Under the sad circumstances, I feel that any meeting between us would be improper. Doubtless you will agree with me. I have accordingly made my arrangements to return at once to town, and by the time you receive this letter, assuming that you have made your promised visit to Worthing, I shall already be on my way back there. I think it will be wise if we allow a considerable time to elapse before attempting to see one another again. We have both, I am afraid, acted rather more impulsively than is altogether consistent with worldly prudence, and to put it at the lowest, an interval for reflection and a cool weighing of the whole situation will certainly not harm either of us. You will understand, of course, that I blame myself far more than you for the unfortunate happenings of the past few days. I am leaving my town address with the hotel people, should you desire to write me a line in reply. I do not ask it. I do not say adieu, for I sincerely hope that at some future time we shall see a great deal of each other. Believe me to be, my dear Miss Lomont, your earnest friend and well-wisher, Henry Judge. After flashing through the letter from beginning to end, to extract its message, Isbel allowed it to slip from her hand, while she sat back with closed eyes. Then she picked it up again, and twice re-read it, word by word. During the perusal, her bosom rose and sank, the blood mounting to her face and once or twice she laughed. Crushing the sheets into her handbag, she closed it with an angry snap. So that was over. The manager escorted her to the outer door. At the foot of the hotel steps she came to a standstill, not knowing in the least what to do or where to go. 
she caught sight of an elegantly dressed lady in expensive furs who was in the act of entering a closed car not five yards away from where she was standing the chauffeur was taking his final instructions preparatory to assuming his seat the lady's back was towards her but somehow her figure struck a familiar chord but first of all runhill court said the unknown as she stooped to get in isbel felt bemused it was not the destination named which dismayed her faculties and made her feel as though she were in a dream though this destination was extraordinary enough in all conscience but the intonation with which the words were uttered that sweet sinking whisper belonged only to one person of her acquaintance and she could not conceive a second voice like it in the world it was mrs richborough's as the car drove off she obtained a single rapid glimpse of the lady's face mrs richborough was dead and therefore it could not be she but then it must be her twin sister the resemblance was absolutely uncanny well it was not difficult to understand why a sister should be there at such a distressful time but what in the world was she doing at runhill what possible interest could she have in that house evidently some mystery was afoot could it be that judge had arranged a meeting with her there in order to talk over the affairs of her late sister but what affairs could there be to discuss between them and why select that out of the way spot for the interview what did it all mean she turned to the smart-looking young hotel door-porter who still stood gazing after the car who is that lady lady brook miss is she in any way related to the late mrs richborough do you know i've never seen them together miss and i should say it's very unlikely lady brook is a very exclusive lady she did tell the chauffeur runhill court didn't she now miss arundel was the surprised answer isbel was greatly perplexed but thought it wise to ask no more questions about her she inquired for and was directed to the nearest hiring garage in the neighbourhood of the hotel it had entered her mind that she too must go to runhill though what she expected to accomplish by so doing she had no idea that door porter must have received certain instructions or perhaps he had mistaken the person she had referred to she knew that it was either mrs richborough or her twin sister and she knew that woman had said runhill court it was absolutely necessary and important that she should follow her there to see what was on foot and of course mr judge must be waiting for her there and it was all lies 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 she was lucky in getting a landaulette at once money was of no account to her she agreed to the charge demanded without demur and within five minutes was on her way the car was badly sprung and jolted her abominably the cushion stank of oil her tooth started to ache again although it was not actually raining the day was gloomy and forbidding and everything seemed saturated with damp water dripped from the trees the roads were greasy and they kept skidding not a single gleam of light sky promised better things isbel squeezed herself in a corner and closed her eyes after passing staining she roused herself the chauffeur seemed an utter idiot his work was in this part of the country and yet he was for ever pulling up to ask her for directions she told him as well as she could would this terrible journey never come to an end at last they reached the lane which ran past the lodge here the road forked one lane went by the lodge the other which he did not know appeared to skirt the western boundary of the estate going due north somewhere the chauffeur stopped the car once more at this fork and isbel was about to direct him to proceed straight forward when suddenly her eyes rested on a fashionably dressed woman in furs who was walking quickly but delicately up the second lane away from them she was about twenty yards ahead and was alone it was she so he had lied that porter but oh heavens 
what an appalling resemblance to mrs richborough she could pick up that step out of a thousand others then she wasn't dead the whole thing was a conspiracy directed against her isbel judge had fallen a victim to that woman at last and they were quietly putting her out of the way as an inconvenient person the hotel manager had been bribed there was really nothing left to explain you needn't come any further i'm getting out isbel suited the action to the word the man looked dissatisfied am i to wait no you can go home do i pay you or the garage being a casual hirer she had to pay him she hurriedly gave him notes to cover the charge and without waiting for the change or interesting herself in his further movements at once turned her back on him and started quickly up the lane round the bend of which the unknown woman had by this time vanished she reached the bend herself the disagreeable noise of the departing car grew fainter and fainter as the distance increased between them and finally she heard no sounds but those of nature everything around her was moist dripping and sullen mrs richborough for she had now no doubt that it was she was still a considerable distance in front they were both walking swiftly so there was no question of catching her up isbel did not quite understand where she was going to but probably there was another way into the grounds from this side which would obviate the necessity of passing through the lodge gate but if so how had that woman come to know of it and by the way where had her car disappeared to isbel asked herself many questions during that period but she was unable to answer any one of them the whole right-hand side of the lane was bordered by an ancient red brick wall which bounded the estate beyond it was a park looking grey and disconsolate enough on such a day as this the wet grass was knee-high and every faintest breath of wind brought water off the brown-leaved trees the park sloped downhill from the lane at first but presently it became level a dark grey shadowy mass on the forward right was probably the house itself very likely it was not so far away as it looked but the light was so bad suddenly half way along a straight stretch of lane her quarry vanished isbel was careful to keep her eye on the spots where she had last observed her no doubt there would be an entrance there into the grounds upon coming up to it she found her anticipation was realised a small iron wicket gate opened into the park it had been swung to but was unlatched a gravel walk barely wide enough for two people side by side led through the grass and under trees towards what could now distinctly be seen to be the house it was slightly uphill isbel passed in without hesitation after walking quickly for about five minutes she again saw the woman she was as far ahead as ever she had reached the foot of the steep sloping lawn under the house and now turned sharply to the left which would evidently bring her to the northeast side of the building though how she could be so certain of her direction on this her first visit to the grounds was more than isbel could say the house itself was by this time quite close standing high above her in the grey mist it looked a huge weird erection the more especially as it was a mere silhouette the part which faced her must be the back the french windows of the dining-room the bedrooms of the top storey etc but by the time that isbel had gained the same spot beneath the lawn the woman had again disappeared she also turned to the left the path curved and in another minute or two she was in full view of the north-east front the lawn which was still steeper on this side towered above her in that dim visibility like a veritable mountain slope and crowning it was the great house vast shadowy and grim she could just make out the gable underneath which was the window of the east room while she paused to gaze up she became aware that the woman was standing close beside her then her doubts were removed it was mrs richborough there was something disquieting and peculiar in her appearance however perhaps it was the way she was standing her hands were free 
and they crossed not over her breast but over the lower part of her body with straightened elbows she was also very erect and still her face appeared white and smiling under the decorative veil she wore but perhaps it was illusion the light was so poor isbel felt a strange uneasiness they told me at the hotel that something happened to you oh yes i am dead came the whispering voice i died last night and then isbel realised that her eyes were closed that this being standing opposite to her with the dress and bearing of a fashionable woman did not see the world as other people her tongue was paralysed and she shook from head to foot the apparition vanished end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain the flash of day the mist came on thicker it was so wetting that her clothes and face streamed with moisture though she was too distressed to think of seeking shelter the upper lawn appeared as a dark shadow against the paler grey of the sky while the house itself was out of sight as she stood trying to overcome her agitation something began to affect her ears it was not exactly a sound but was more like a heavy pulsing her head throbbed with it till she thought she should go mad then it ceased abruptly five minutes later the figure of a man loomed up out of the mist and approached her it was judge isbel pressed her fur tightly to her throat and turned away so it is you when he replied there was a suppressed exuberance in his voice which immediately arrested her attention by its unusualness yes it is i then you told me an untruth you have not gone to london i called here on my way back well i got your letter perhaps you are wondering why i have followed you here after having received my dismissal i don't want anything from you and i don't know myself why i came mrs richborough led me here i know now that she's dead but i have seen her and spoken to her for all that judge seemed not to remark her statement for he asked another question did you hear my playing your playing yes he eyed her curiously your manner is very extraordinary surely you recognize where you are are you awake or asleep i am quite awake and i fully realize where i am mr judge i am trespassing in your grounds but it won't be for long i am going home now haven't you been to the house your house hardly i think he drew a step closer and for the first time she observed that he was not wearing a hat tell me where you think you are i have already told you it's your manner which is very singular mr judge are you quite well listen i am talking with you here and i am where we wished to be yesterday does it not seem so to you too i don't understand you where did we wish to be yesterday he gave her another searching look so you really are seeing differently and you have not been up that staircase to-day i haven't set foot inside your house i tell you have you lost your senses no but i have been up that staircase to-day and i have not yet come down again oh my god said isbel quietly i was wretched and could not keep away from the house it contained all my memories the stairs were there i climbed them passing straight into that other room i got through the window and succeeded in reaching the ground without accident though it was not easy she stared at him with frightened eyes and where are you now i am standing beside you in the open country in full sunshine and it's spring not autumn you cannot believe it you must see for yourself that it isn't so feel me i am wet with the fine rain but he came no nearer the man is asleep and the sight of his instruments put an idea into my head i could not see you but i felt you were somewhere in the neighbourhood so i played to you what man the man we saw from the window yesterday 
there was an embarrassed silence but this is awful said isbel you must be attempting to mystify me mr judge if not no i am speaking the truth isbel and i am quite rational the blood came to her face you have not yet acquired the right to call me by that name mr judge you don't understand but matters can be set right where are you now going he had started to move off but stopped at her question i shall play again but this is sheer insanity you did not think so last evening when we heard that music in the hall she said nothing let me go proceeded judge quietly i only ask you to reserve your judgment for five minutes and in the meantime to wait here should i fail to open your eyes by then i give you full permission to think of me what you will please wait isbel stared after him with a puzzled frown as he made his way up and across the long wet grass he had hardly taken ten steps before his form merged into the grey of the mist and was swallowed up she heard nothing but the dripping of the sodden trees while waiting with a fast beating heart for the outcome of this strange business she experienced the same sensations in her ears as before it was an inaudible throbbing too marked to be disregarded but so unassociated that she was unable even to decide if its cause were internal or external after continuing for a minute or two it left off as suddenly as it had started nearly at the same time she was surprised to see the day rapidly brightening the sky grew lighter and the mists thinner she could look further away each moment in less than five minutes after judge's departure the sun itself had come through the blue sky appeared the ground vapours dispersed and the whole country became visible the transition was so abrupt that she scarcely knew how to take it almost in a flash to the radiance and heat of an early summer day a wind sprang up and long before she had accommodated herself to the change there was not a wisp of cloud in the sky she loosened her fur wrap she was standing in the same attitude looking up towards the house suddenly a shock passed through her system she had just realized the house was gone it had vanished absolutely and entirely and not only the house but its grounds as well including the very lawn on which her foot had been resting she discovered herself to be on the side of a steep grassy hill through the turf of which the naked chalk showed she was some way down from the top but there was not the least room for doubt that there was no building there its bare ridge joined the sky from end to end here was a miracle indeed upon turning swiftly to see what was behind her she was bewildered to meet the identical panorama which she and judge had viewed yesterday from that window the hillside she stood on was where the strangely dressed man had been she recognised at once by its general configuration and relation to the landscape the sharp smooth slope descended to the same little valley along which flowed the same little brook beyond it was that other hill with the unbroken forest stretching to the horizon after staring for a few moments she clapped her hand to her eyes and cried out she could not understand it and she feared she was on the point of losing her reason but when she looked again she saw the same things down to the smallest detail and all was so brightly coloured so solid so real in appearance that she could not hesitate any longer to accept the scene as being actually existent and it was so beautiful the forest trees were clothed in fresh green leaves the smaller trees in the valley underneath were smothered with white blossom songbirds trilled and twittered a wood-pigeon was cooing softly two distant cuckoos seemed to be answering each other high overhead a lark fluttered and sang the caressing wind brought to her the rich moist fragrance of the whole countryside yes yes it was spring she remembered everything every particular of her three visits to those other rooms at runhill returned to her with startling distinctness so that she was amazed how she could ever have forgotten moreover her whole relation to henry 
both in private and in public, were suddenly made clear. She saw how worldly prudence on his side, angry pride on hers, had nearly succeeded in wrecking their happiness. And now this state of affairs had arisen, not from any fault of character on either part, not from any insufficiency of love, but from pure ignorance of the fact. They had not known that they belonged to each other. Her heart sang as she saw him approaching her from higher up. He was only a short distance away. Still further back, behind him, she caught a glimpse of the gaily dressed musician. He was lying on his side, head uphill, back towards her, apparently asleep. His fiddle-shaped instrument was beside him. Isbel gave him a silent welcome, but at that moment Henry was the more wonderful vision of the two. She had no real eyes for anything but him. They hastened to each other with outstretched hands. "'You heard me this time,' laughed Henry, enfolding her and looking down into her eyes. "'My ears throbbed. Was that really you? Oh, Henry, what a terribly narrow escape we've had. How could we have been so absolutely insane? Surely we must have known that that ring was not thrown away for nothing.' "'Some kind fate is watching over us, evidently.' Whether we deserve it by our stupidity is quite another matter. However, you see now I'm not so mad as you thought I was. It's heaven, I think. But is it true? Where's the house gone to? We're in the house. Even while they were speaking, the brightness of the day began perceptibly to fade, almost as though a solar eclipse were creeping on. The sun became obscured by haze. The blue of the sky grew paler and paler. Thin mists commenced again to crawl about the lower regions. The wind dropped, and a sort of hush came over the scene. The birds sang more fitfully. "'It's getting darker,' whispered Isbel, with a slight shiver, uneasily drawing her fur closer to her. "'No, no, dismiss the possibility. It can't change now.' His strong-featured face smiled down at her protectingly. Let's hope not. How do you mean? We're in the house. I entered it from the grounds, and haven't passed out again into the grounds. Therefore, I'm still in it, and you're with me. I don't profess to understand, but it is so, and it can't be otherwise. The mist sensibly thickened. Isbel could scarcely distinguish the trees on the opposite side of the valley. The sun disappeared. The sky was a whitish grey, while the air felt cold and damp. "'Henry, I'm going,' she said, quietly detaching herself from his embrace. "'Everything's falling back.' His face fell in alarm. "'What's the matter? What's happening to you?' "'We're returning to the old state. The sun's gone in, and it's growing misty and cold. Oh, can't you see it?' "'No, I can't. There's no difference at all. The day is as glorious as ever it was. Exert your will.' "'My mind is getting all mixed up, too. "'I seem to be losing my grip of things. "'Do you know, I can hardly remember yesterday.' "'My poor, poor girl, make an effort. "'Force yourself to see that it isn't so.' "'Unfortunately, one cannot conquer facts. "'Oh, I'm going back right enough. "'It's been a short-lived dream this time, but it doesn't signify.' "'Judge bit his nails in agitation. "'What's to be done? Something must be done. "'I must think of something.' "'I verily believe you are more concerned than I,' she replied, smiling. "'You had better wake that man. Is he still lying there? I can no longer see.' "'Wake him?' "'Is he too terrible to be waked?' "'His face is buried in his arm.' "'Perhaps he will help us. He has done so before. But be quick. It will soon be too late.' "'I'll go at once. May it turn out well. There's something very unusual in his appearance.' By that time, both the crest of the hill and the valley beneath were blotted out. She was unable to see for more than a few feet around her, while the mist resembled a fine driving rain, which did its work none the less effectually because it was impalpable. She signed to Judge to stop, and after staring at him for a few moments, with knitted brows, said, "'I'm afraid I've lost the thread of my ideas. Of whom are we speaking?' "'Of that man, the musician.' "'What man? What musician?' 
isbel mr judge she said quietly my head is very confused and i have to plead guilty to not remembering what or whom we were talking about but one thing i do recollect i requested you a short time ago to address me with the same courtesy which you would use towards any other lady of your acquaintance judge turned pale and bowed you left me a few minutes ago she went on and it seems you've come back is there any advantage to be gained by our pursuing this conversation i have no explanation to offer which you would at present be able to understand i will absent myself once more please be good enough to wait here a few moments longer i have complete confidence that everything will be made clear to you his features bore an expression of earnestness and humility which succeeded only in still further irritating her no i am going home your conduct ever since yesterday mr judge is entirely beyond my comprehension but i will put the most charitable construction upon it that i can and give you a word of advice continue your journey to london with as little delay as possible and lose no time in seeking your medical adviser judge bowed again i think we shall not see one another again proceeded isbel i will take this opportunity of saying good-bye it has been a very broken friendship without waiting for any further speech from him she started slowly to mount the lawn having no definite plans for getting back to brighton but feeling that she would gain her bearings better from the house in the first place she did not trust herself to retrace the route by which she had come the thick white rolling vapours shut her in as in a prison judge standing there in brilliant sunshine and an atmosphere which showed everything as clear-cut and painted saw her one moment and failed to see her the next she had disappeared before his eyes he made a gesture of dismay and began in hot haste to scramble up the hillside obliquely in the direction of the sleeping musician isbel heard a long low scraping sound like the slow drawing of a bow across the low string of a deep-toned viol it was succeeded by silence she was by this time close up to the house and she looked towards it but was unable to understand where she had come to it was a different building as well as could be distinguished through the mist it was constructed entirely of unpainted timber from top to bottom the roof was flat without gables and there appeared to be four stories then the fog shut out the vision again a strange warmth was running through her body all her other sensations seemed to be merged in the recollection that she was a woman fever was abroad in the air and her blood grew hotter and hotter that musical noise returned but now the note was low fierce passionate exactly resembling a deep forced human cry of love pain everything happened in a single second between twin periods of fog and gloom came one flash of summer sunlight it entered upon her with the abrupt unexpectedness of a stroke and before she realised where she was or what had happened to her it had departed again leaving her stunned and terrified meanwhile this is what she seemed to see she was standing in sunshine again on that bare hill gazing at the distant forest across the valley the sky was cloudless she was nearly at the top of the hill and the house had vanished she recollected everything but could settle to nothing her mood was one of unutterable excitement and reckless audacity she appeared to herself to be laughing and sobbing under her breath henry and that other man were facing each other on the hillside a little way below her the man was tall and stout and in his bright coloured archaic garments cut an extraordinary figure he held his instrument against his chest and was in the act of drawing his bow across it the note she heard had not yet come to an end his back was turned towards her so that she could not see his face but henry who was standing erect and motionless beyond was looking right into it and from his expression it was as though he were beholding some appalling vision she screamed and ran towards him calling him by name 
Before she had taken three steps, however, the musician jerked his whole force savagely into his bow-arm, and she was brought up with a violent shock. Such sharp brutality of passion she had never heard expressed by any sound. The sunlight grew suddenly hotter and darker. The landscape appeared to close rapidly in upon her. Some catastrophe was impending. Her blood was boiling and freezing. At that moment it seemed to her that yonder strange man was the centre around which everything in the landscape was moving, and that she herself was no more than his dream. And then Henry's face was crossed by an expression of sickness. He changed colour. She caught a faint groan, and directly afterwards he sank helplessly to the ground, where he continued lying quite still. She stood paralysed, staring in horror. The sunlight vanished instantaneously. Everything was grey and cold again. The sky was leaden. She saw nothing but driving rain mists. She rubbed her eyes with her knuckles, wondering what had occurred, how she came to be standing there as in a dream, why she felt so sick and troubled. Then she quietly fainted where she stood. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Marshall's Journey. On arriving at Lloyd's at ten o'clock on the same morning, Marshall found among his letters a typewritten envelope of uncommercial size and shape. Out of curiosity, he opened it the first. The communication enclosed was typed on small feminine notepaper, and was neither addressed nor signed. It was, in fact, anonymous. Before reading it, he turned again to the envelope to inspect the postmark. It was stamped Worthing. The only person he could think of as staying at Worthing was Judge. He read the following words. If Mr. Stokes is interested to know how Miss L. spends her time during his temporary absences, it might be as well for him to inquire at Runhill Court. There is every reason to believe that she will be there tomorrow, Friday morning, before lunch, for the third time this week, and he may consider the matter of sufficient importance to justify his presence there on the same occasion. Should it not be before lunch, it may be after. It is believed that there are rooms in the house which are not easy to discover. Marshall carefully folded the letter and deposited it in his pocket case. Then he sat back and began to slowly pass his hand over his eyes and forehead. His first impulse was to ignore the whole business destroy the note and say nothing about it to isbel or any one else to start testing the accuracy of a charge of which naturally he did not believe a single word would be equivalent to admitting that there might be a possibility of truth in it and that would be a ghastly insult to isbel but then there was the question of libel some ill-disposed person probably a woman was evidently bent on mischief and it was doubtful how far she would go if no counter-action was taken. The thing, obviously, was to find out, in the first place, who wrote the letter. The police were out of the question, and private inquiry agents were not much better. He did not intend to have her name banded about by these professional gentlemen. She herself was the only one who might be able to throw light on the business. He would show her the letter that same evening when he went down to Brighton, and they would talk it over together. A person who was prepared to go to that criminal length did not spring out of empty space. Isbel would have a tolerable idea who it was, and why she, or he, had done it. Of course, spite was at the bottom of it, but what he could not quite see through was the explicit character of the charge. Where was the sense of quoting time and place 
when the writer must be aware that any action taken on the statement would expose the whole damn lie probably it was a bit of low cunning it was thought that he would not take action and that the poison would continue to rankle in his mind that seemed all right as far as he could see and in that case he was not at all sure that it might not be good policy to make the move he was not expected to make of course before going to runhill to see what game was on foot he would look isbel up at brighton and very likely take her with him he made hurried arrangements for his deputy to carry on during his absence and immediately afterwards left for victoria it was not long after noon when he arrived at the gondy hotel mrs moore gave an exclamation of surprise when she saw him good gracious marshal what can this mean he told the story of having met a man where's isbel he added quickly isbel it seemed had been out for two hours and mrs moore had no idea where she was in a very decomposed manner marshall muttered something about returning later in the day he took his departure abruptly almost rudely she could not think what had come over him perhaps it was some business worry meanwhile marshall with a face which grew sterner at each minute sought his car in the hotel garage while it was being got out he produced and lit a cigar he wished to assure himself that his feelings were tranquil and that the visit to runhill he was about to make was a quite ordinary matter-of-fact transaction of no special consequence and undertaken merely as a piece of necessary routine work perhaps he really did not see perhaps he did not wish to see that it can never be an ordinary transaction to test a woman's honour he got in turned up the collar of his rainproof coat pulled down his crushed-in hat and started off it was a quarter to one he pushed the car along fast to shoreham but once past the houses he let her go altogether in just over the half-hour he reached runhill lodge Friday appeared marshall got down good afternoon is there anyone up at the house he had returned the cigar stump to his mouth when he had spoken the boss is there sir mr judge ah anyone with him the keen glint of his eye as he threw a side glance belied his indifferent tone no sir he's by himself he ain't been there much above half an hour marshall remained silent for a minute i'll walk up to him i think shall i open the gate no i said i'd walk up the car's quite all right where it is thank you priday he threw away his stump passed through the side gate and started slowly up the drive with bent head priday after gazing after him for a short time disappeared again inside the lodge the dismal wetting mist made it no sort of day to be out in as he approached the house marshall saw a small car standing outside the main entrance it was evidently judge's when he came up to it he leant over the side to make a somewhat ashamed but none the less careful scrutiny of the seats and floor he hardly dared to confess himself what he feared to see there it was with heartfelt relief that he failed to detect anything of a compromising character he crossed to the house the hall door was unlocked he opened it and went straight in the hall was grey sombre and silent he wondered which would be the likeliest part of the house to start looking for judge nine chances out of ten he would be upstairs in his favourite lurking spot the east room it might be good sense to go there first what did that damned correspondence mean by there being rooms hard to find oh hell isbel couldn't be there priday said that no one was there except judge why the devil was he wasting precious time mooning in the hall when he ought by now to be up at the top of the house he made for the main staircase and raced up three steps at a time without pausing on the landing he immediately attacked the upper flight and in less than a minute was groping his way through the black darkness of the upstairs corridor 
he saw at once that the door of the east room was standing open upon getting closer he saw something else a man was lying huddled and motionless on the floor near one of the walls it required no flash of inspiration to guess that it was judge but what had happened to him was he asleep fainting or drunk he leapt over to him and pulled his face round then let go again in horror the man was dead there was no doubt of the fact and there was little doubt of the cause of death the discoloured face told its own story apoplexy to make quite sure he tested the heart after crouching for at least five minutes with his hand on judge's naked chest he saw that it was hopeless to go on there was not the faintest whisper of a heart-beat he did whatever he thought was immediately necessary then walked away and downstairs to fetch assistance the unexpected tragedy had put his own affair entirely out of his head he had forgotten isbel's connection with the house and for the moment almost her very existence he was too preoccupied with his immediate plans for action to see anything around him otherwise on reaching the head of the main staircase he would have at once perceived straight ahead of him isbel herself sitting in a chair near the other end of the hall as it was it was not until he was close upon her that he jumped back with a start her face was white her eyes were closed her clothing appeared to be wet and stained with mud while her whole attitude was one of lassitude and exhaustion isbel what does this mean he came on again until he nearly stood over her she opened her eyes slowly and looked up with weary indifference manifesting no surprise at his presence nor indeed any emotion whatever how did you get here was all she asked never mind me how did you come to be in this house i fainted outside and came in to sit down before going home outside but what were you doing outside what are you doing in this part of the world at all it was several seconds before she answered don't be hard on me marshall i can't explain now i have a confession to make but not now he whipped the anonymous letter out of his pocket-case and handed it to her will you read that she did so while he watched her closely his heart sank as he saw that she showed neither astonishment nor indignation she read it through twice quite apathetically and then passed it back without a word well demanded marshall i know who wrote that is that what you want never mind who wrote it is it true perhaps it isn't true but it was written in good faith i meant to come here this morning with mr judge but he disappointed me i see may i ask why but he was unable to finish why i wish to be here with him she smiled bitterly please don't press me to give explanation which you won't receive there was dead silence then you haven't seen him to-day asked marshall i can't say i don't know i don't know whom i've seen and whom i haven't seen i have fainted i don't know anything so perhaps you don't know where he is at this moment that i'll swear to marshall i've only just this minute entered the house for the first time then i'll tell you he's upstairs in the east room he looked at her to see if she were as ignorant of the tragedy as her words and manner professed but she did not even appear interested dead he added suddenly and brutally isbel half rose from her seat and turned such a greenish colour that he thought she was about to swoon again but he did not go to her assistance she recovered herself by an effort have you killed him she demanded quietly i have not i don't believe in private assassinations he has had some sort of fit and now i'm off to tell priday and fetch a doctor we had better resume this very interesting conversation later and if i may venture to offer a suggestion there will probably be an inquest and if you have no special desire to appear among the witnesses 
it would be as well for you to lose no time in getting clear of the premises does any one know you're here barring judge himself no then how did you get in by another gate well take my advice and go out the same way can you find your way on to the main staining road i expect so then walk on and i'll pick you up in the car further on i've got to fetch a doctor so you'll be there as soon as i shall go now don't waste time isbel remained sitting marshall what is it how long has he been dead priday says he's only been in the house half an hour that was fifteen minutes ago perhaps he can't have been dead long why because i feel as if something has snapped inside me since i fell down in that faint it must have been at the same time do you think it's strange that i don't express a wish to go up and see him i'm exceedingly sorry isbel but i can't enter into your wishes or feelings of course there's not the slightest need for you to go up and i strongly advise you not to she directed a pitiful smile towards him i know there's no going back to the old state please don't imagine that i even wish to i merely want to tell you that perhaps my feelings towards him were not altogether what you think they were i-but you came here to meet him isbel dived into her handbag impulsively marshall you've shown me a letter now i'll show you one read that he took it rather unwillingly and skimmed it through who is this mrs richborough he speaks about the person who wrote to you it seems a fatal business all round and is this letter of judges a blind or did it really extend no further i wish you to believe that mr judge was a man of honour that's all now i'll go i won't insult you by expressing my sorrow for the position i put you in you've always been good to me and i'm afraid i've repaid you in the meanest possible way good-bye for the time being she got up and started to stumble towards the door do you feel yourself able to walk as far as i proposed marshall asked in a singular tone she stopped to look back over her shoulder it seems to me that i have no alternative that's quite true i can't come with you for i have this awful business to attend to how long will it take you to get clear of the grounds by the way you're going i don't know ten minutes i'll sit here for ten minutes by my watch and then make my way to the lodge walk on towards staining and if i haven't picked you up by the time you've reached there wait for me at the station is that clear yes marshal incidentally how did you get here by hired car from worthing but i dismissed the driver short of the house all right then you'd better clear off he sat down in the chair which she had vacated and pulled out his watch isbel hesitated a moment as if she wished to say something more then a flash of anger at her own weakness seemed to come across her for she suddenly straightened herself and walked directly to the door ten minutes later marshall rose left the house and started down the drive towards the lodge it was nearing four o'clock when he and isbel returned to the gondi together isbel went straight to her room marshall sought mrs moore and without beating about the bush informed her that the engagement was broken off by mutual agreement he referred her to isbel for all explanations she was greatly upset but had too much good sense to attempt to combat his decision there and then without learning more about the affair she wished him godspeed and begged him with tears in her eyes at least to leave the road open for further negotiations however he declined to make any kind of promise or to discuss things with her at all he spent the night at the hotel but dined out and retired to his room early on the following morning he packed his belongings settled his bill and started back to town in the car without having attempted previously to see mrs moore for the purpose of saying farewell the inquest was held on tuesday marshall was called upon to give evidence as to the finding of the body but everything was purely formal 
the medical witness certified that death was due to cerebral hemorrhage and the jury returned their verdict accordingly isbel did not attend the two ladies returned to kensington as arranged in the middle of the week isbel refused to discuss matters with her aunt or to see any of her friends blanche behaved with great tact she neither wrote to her nor called but she was continually sending flowers and kind messages by way of mrs moor and isbel was not ungrateful a few weeks afterwards aunt and niece went to the riviera blanche thought the occasion propitious to resume a correspondence with her friend and isbel acquiesced though without any particular pleasure the first letters were very correct but as time passed marshall's name began to appear on blanche's side with greater frequency in the beginning isbel thought that it was an unintentional blundering against good taste it was not long before she realised that the thin end of the wedge had become too securely hammered in to be easily dislodged she passed over the illusions in silence then the time came for them to return home it was march i want to know how we're to stand billy she wrote her friend we see a good deal of marshall in these days if you happen to run up against him in my house may i take it that you will behave towards him with common politeness isbel wrote back if marshall is able to endure my society i shall certainly be able to endure his on the evening of the same day that blanche received this letter she showed these lines to marshall himself he coloured violently well how am i to answer she demanded tell her i'm not quite a savage is that all don't you think we'd better take one step at a time asked marshall blanche smiled and suddenly grasped his wrist End of chapter 20 End of The Haunted Woman by David Lindsay Read by Phil Benson